business. Act Among the four factors of production that forms the bedrock of any economy, labor definitely stands above board. Why is that so? Because it deals with human resources. How organizations are able to manage their human resources will determine the success or the failure of their vision as well as the enterprise. This is Business Matters. My name is Stephen Ipalabal Lawson, and you're welcome because here, business truly matters. The new normal has brought about a total change on how human resources engages with their staffs, especially in an organization that is quite diversified. How an organization is able to enable people adopt to the change that is our today's reality will help us begin to see how that organization is indeed one of the best places to work. Let us have a business update. Hey beautiful, your eyes, your smile are all begging me to take you home tonight. Now reading page three. <laughs> Experience unlimited super fast internet access from Intel 4G. Intel, live more. On Business Matters, it is our culture and tradition to invite professionals who have distinguished themselves in their different offerings. As a matter of fact, we do this because their insight and understanding will help you, our viewers, be able to adopt different ideas and, of course, innovations that can help your business thrive. This is our professional segment. Joining me in the studio is a seasoned human resource executive with over 20 years' experience in delivering value across the entire HR value chain. He is the convener of the HR transformation series uh, called um, HR Demystified. Our experience definitely spans several sectors, which includes ICT, telecommunication, power, oil and gas, and definitely government. She is the managing partner of MML Consulting, a performance coach speaker and author of the life performance book called Time to Soar. And to help me explore the topic, human resources, managing demotivated staff, please help me make welcome Uche Lotana Anajemba. How are you, Uche? Great, thank you. And thank you for having me on the air today. It's, well, it's a great honor for us, especially with this time that we were looking forward to having you in the studio. And uh, definitely the corona pandemic has definitely brought about a new normal. How's, it, how's that been for you? It must be. Uh, it's very interesting because what it's done is it's basically forced us into the new way of working. And um, to be honest, um, I'm a big technology enthusiast and I've always believed that this is the way to work. Once you have discipline and you have um, the tools and um, a guiding culture of how to do it. So what coronavirus has basically done is it's forced us into a new way of working that really we should have explored many years ago, especially living in cities like Lagos, where getting from one point to the other becomes a very peculiar task. So 
I, I welcomed the opportunity to be able to still work effectively from home um, while still looking out for my family. Um, and I've basically made adjustments um, to the new realities. And it's, it's, it's my be here to stay for a few more months or maybe a couple of years. And I'm ready for what it means. <laughs> so are we looking more of a model that you can say is the spirit of work-life balance, especially with this new normal? I, you know, the, the interesting thing is that I don't necessarily think that people are working less because they're at home. You know, they, I actually find that a lot of people now, the hours and the days have merged because they're at home, they start early and they carry on to late at night. But at least they can see their family. So maybe that is the work-life balance that, you know, the nearest to work-life balance that we're going to ever find. I, I personally think that work-life balance is a myth especially when you are in a developing economy where everything you know, is not there for you, is not configured to sort of support businesses, um, and you have to work harder than anybody else. So this is our new reality. And yes, this might be the closest to work-life balance in my ever <laughs> All right, talking about our real reality, I mean, the new reality that is definitely confronting us. In your own extensive experience, I'm going to the topic of our conversation today. What factors can demotivate a company's um, workforce? And uh, uh, are there telltale signs, uh, especially of this nature, which you definitely want to term demotivation? You see, uh, this, this topic is one that is very dear to my heart. Because at the heart of this is the reason why we sometimes see what we call bad work ethics and bad work culture. At the root of it is a major element of demotivation. And so if you don't deal with the root cause, what you continue to deal with is the symptom and you never actually arrive at the solution. And so talking about employee demotivation, um, some of the things that cause employee demotivation is when people are working without a vision. Mm. And, and I'll explain that a bit more. You find a lot of companies um, start off in one direction, but because there's no set strategic vision or there's no clear plan. They basically started because there was an existing opportunity and they jumped on it. They didn't have a trajectory for what they were trying to do. You then find people just moving between visions, between ideas, between products and services. And then you have a workforce that is supposed to follow you on this journey. So after a while, when you see that you're not even sure what you're trying to achieve, they start to switch off because they have their own desires and ambitions. And if, they want, if they're going to follow you, they need to be sure that you know where you're going to. Now, another reason why people or employees get motivated in the workplace is because of unfulfilled promises. So there's something I describe as a sincerity of purpose, where um, a lot of businesses have a desire and intention to do a particular thing. But maybe due to economic factors, a bad financial year, or sometimes even just a lack of integrity, they never actually do what they've agreed to do. But then you then expect the same level of engagement and motivation from the people that are following you, the people that are working for you, when you have failed on your own promises. So that's one of the quickest ways to have people demotivated when they believe that you're never going to make do on your promise, you're not going to do what you have said you will do. You can't have people, um, there's like a lack of trust, and that lack of trust then becomes a, a lack of morale and then becomes demotivation, which starts to manifest in different behaviors that you see within organizations. Well, Lagos, for example, is a very quell um, environment, especially with um, traffic management. And a lot of staff, as a matter of fact, live on one end of town and then they move to the central business street street, um, where they basically work. Uh, people will argue that um, part of that stress itself might be a contributing factor to uh, most of them being dem demotivated. Will you agree with that? 100%. I agree with that. So when it comes to the motivation, there are very, very many reasons, and that is one of them. But that one even happens because it's basically a lethargy. You know, when you spend a lot of your your energy trying to get through the Herculean tax of, you know, like you described, going from one part of Lagos to the other part of Lagos, there's little energy left for creativity and innovation. So you're first recovering from the the the, the drudgery of what you've just done. And that in itself can, you know, daily take away your spark until you get to the point where it's just basically a carcass that, is, that turns up at work. So wow. now that people are having to work from home, I would actually expect a, a better level of engagement where they can, for some, for some people, where they have conducive home environments, because they're cutting out maybe on the average of maybe three to four hours of travel time. That's true. So you're very correct that 
the impact of travel can also play a role in the motivation. Because after a while, you start to ask yourself, um, especially if you spend a lot of money even on that transportation or buying fuel because you know, you're in traffic for long hours, and you look at the end of the month, you're like, well, how much is left? Why exactly am I even doing this job? The ends are not meeting. And that starts to cause the motivation. So that is very correct. So will you share with us, I mean, trust more life, because to every action, there is a reaction. And one will regard that the impact of, a, of demotivated staff, especially in a company, obviously will, will definitely be, be registered in the negatives. It is the negatives every single time. And um, you're very correct. For every action, there's an, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So what usually happens is that globally, right, um, the statistics show that 85% of the global workforce are always in a state of demotivation or the other. So that basically tells you that maybe about two to three, two out of three people in every organization are currently experiencing demotivation. Now, what that also then means is it starts to manifest itself in things like sickness and absenteeism. So either absenteeism due to genuine sickness or lethargy or just general absenteeism. And then when you do that, what you then find is that you have very few people doing the, lock, doing the work of very many people. If you see a, a reduction in productivity of the organization. You see a reduction in the quality of the output of the work that is done. And then you see a reduction in the return on investment to the bottom line of the organization. Then you see a bad and toxic culture start to arise within the organization. And overall, it's just a lose-lose situation for the company if nothing is done about it. Are there practical uh, steps that organizations can take um, in order to ensure that the morale of their human resources remains optimal? And what, one of the things that comes to mind also is that if the money is good, would, would that be good motivation? <laughs> Sir, I, mean, I missed the last sentence. Yeah, but what, what, what I said was that in, in terms of the, the different practical um, solutions uh, or steps organizations can actually take um, in order to ensure that uh, they, they derive optimal out, um, output from their human resources. And I'm thinking perhaps that money might just be a very good motivation towards that end. Okay, so yes, there are practical steps that an organization can take to increase the motivation of their workforce. And when I talk about it, I like to break this into two categories. So the first category are your no money keys. So keys to raising motivation in the workplace. And the second ca category are your money keys. So let me talk about the no money keys. The no money keys basically mean that it doesn't cost you anything and you can start to apply it almost immediately and see results in your workforce or the motivation of your people. And the first of the no, no money keys is recognition. So people want to know that you see them, you see who they are, you see their contributions to the workforce, you, you see their experience, their qualifications, and how we can add value to what you're trying to achieve. Mm. So I always tell people, like, there is no point hiring a professional who has a particular skill in an area and then you don't allow them or give them the flexibility and the creativity and innovation to bring all of their experiences to that process or to that organization. It means that basically you hire them to be wallflower. So people want to be recognized for their skills, for their talent and for their contributions to an organization. And that does not cost any money. Now, the second money keys is that people want to be mentored. And when I talk about mentorship, I mean a situation where someone who's a senior colleague, a senior professional, is able to take someone and teach them, show them the way, coach them, give them experience, open up doors for them to ensure that they can fast track their own process or do even more than they did. So somewhat like an informal apprenticeship, because they know that by virtue of being around this person, they are picking up valuable experience that, you know, that they cannot learn um, in a classroom or working somewhere else where they are paying them more money 
but without that kind of mentorship. Okay, Uche, I'm going to ask you to hold your thought. We're going to go on a short break. As soon as we return, we'll continue the conversation uh, because one of the things that I'm very passionate I would like you to throw more light on has to do with the corporate culture, especially with the new normal and the future of work. How exactly can we measure in terms of people who are working from home and then the output at the end of the day? We're going to be back after this break. Experience unlimited super fast internet access from Intel 4G. Intel, live more. All right, thank you. If you just joined us, we are here at uh, Business Matters, exploring the topic uh, managing demotivated staff. And joining me in the studio um, is no other person than Uche Lutana Anajemba. And we've been talking earlier on uh, about so much in terms of mentorship and how all of that can help to be able to create a world of um, what you want to call apprentice apprenticeship, as the case is, and how that itself can help to motivate staff. Anyway, Uche, uh, I would like you to continue on that train of thought before we went on the break. Okay, so the third no money key is challenged. People want to be challenged. If you find that you hire people in organizations and after a while work becomes business as usual. They are doing the same things the same way day in, day out. And that is the quickest way to bring the motivation in the workforce. You know, it, it gets to the point where they are able to do that work in their sleep. They are able to do it in their sleep. There's no, there's no creativity. There's no innovation. There are no new challenges, no special projects that they are working on. It's only a matter of time before the person becomes demotivated. Mm. You know, I remember sometimes when people would tell me that, oh, they know how to just automate their processes and they, they go off to go do other things because they are not challenged in their organizations. And so I find that, you know, even as an employee in the, in the years that I've worked, some of the places that I stayed the longest were places where I was constantly challenged, I was constantly mentored, I was giving new challenges every single time. So stretching me, you know, giving you new goals and new, new aspirations and new opportunities and new, new um, um, projects to work on. So people want to be challenged in the work that they do. If the work becomes mundane and becomes business as usual, you're very likely to lose the same energy and um, um, excitement and motivation that you had from that person in the very beginning. So it's not that the person necessarily has now picked up um, poor work ethics. It's just because they are bored. They are bored. So people need to be challenged for them to become excited about the work that they're doing again, and that excitement drives motivation. But I also have three money keys because everything is not always without um, a cost implication. The three keys I described earlier don't cost you anything. But three keys that will cost you money is rewards. And so when I talk about rewards, I'm talking about compensation, um, money, um, commercial value of the skills that they are giving to you. But I look at it a bit differently. And the way I explain it usually is because of economic crisis, inflation, or like COVID-19 um, that we're dealing with at the moment, a lot of organizations are not necessarily able to pay top money for the skills and the talent that they have. So what I usually tell people is two things, right? You've got to do what you promised. You've got to do what you promised. And when you then make the money, when the company then recovers, when things go back to normal, you have to then pay what they deserve. But what I find is a lot of organizations, where people make promises about compensations or the rewards they're going to give employees, and they turn around and they don't make good on their promise. And yet expect the same level of activated, you know, activation and excitement from people, which is almost impossible. And my advice to him was you need to go find another job because how do you expect people to deliver the same value or even more when you've taken away their source of livelihood and their income, especially in a time like this. And also, a lot of organizations slap people with non-compete clauses where you're not able to offer that same product or service to anybody else while under their employment. Okay, Uche, so because, you because we're pressed... People what you agreed. Yeah. We go and press. then, yeah. when the things become normal, when you make money, when the company becomes profitable, you've got to pay people what they deserve. So, yes, money plays a role in motivating people. 
And also, just to say something concerning that point, there are two types of people. There are the people who are focused on self-actualization and purpose, you know, doing something that outlives them, leaving a lasting legacy. But that's a very small percentage of the people. So if you look at the Maslow's um, theory of need, you'll find that those people are sitting at the top of the pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid, there's space for very few people. But at the bottom of the pyramid, where the basic needs are food, clothing, shelter, me and my basic survival instincts, you'll find that the bottom of the pyramid is very wide, and so you have a lot of people. And so if you use that theory and extrapolate that into um, um, human behavior and organizations, then you have to understand that more people are motivated than, by money than not. So if you have more people motivated by money, then you have to make sure that when you're not even able to pay that, you've got to find other things to make sure that people are engaged when they are working with you. All right, Uche, because, because we're pressed for time, I, I really have one, or, one more question I needed us to touch on um, before I let you go. And if you would be very kind uh, to me to be as brief as you can. Uh, we, we know in terms of um, de demystifying um, human resources, it takes a whole lot of steps. And uh, a lot of the human resource professionals, of course, in the organizations, begin to say that the HR value chain has to begin to help in order for them to create a positive impact in their businesses. Can you throw more light um, to, in, in, with regards to what that entails? Are there steps? Are there units? Or are there departments, as we obviously we want to explore? Yes. So HR is a mystery to a lot of people. People management is very, very difficult. But I always tell people that the business leader, the, the owner of the business, the CEO, the MD, is the first HR practitioner. And so there's a series of steps that is required in the in employee life cycle. So how you hire, how you design your organization, how you hire the right talent for your organization, how you onboard them you know, and integrate them into the culture of the company, how you train them and give them capacity within that organization, how you reward their performance, the, you know, how you develop, you know, culture and competencies and leadership competencies within them to ensure that they can in turn raise the next generation of people that are coming, you know, um, in, in the food, in, in the, within the organization. How you measure their performance and how you reward that performance, but most importantly, how you ensure that HR becomes a profit center deriving value from the workforce. So there is a methodical approach to achieving a high performance organization. And that's basically what HR Demystified is all about. So making, taking away the mystery from managing people and making it practical and applicable every day to ensure that you can derive value for everyone, all the stakeholders, and create a high performance organization that is win-win for everyone. Oh, that's a good one to actually help me wrap up this particular interview. And you'd be amazed how time flies, especially when we have to manage time <laughs> as the case is. I want to say a big thank you so very much, um, um, Uche um, and Ademba, for joining us on Business Matters, especially with this uh, topic, managing demotivated staff. Definitely, a lot of us need mot uh, motivation. Either way, whether it's that which, is, which has cost it attached to it or that which doesn't have cost attached to it. The most important thing is at the end of the day, value is driven and value is given at the end of any business time. I want to say a big thank you one more time, Uche. Thank you very much for having me. Great. All right, viewers, that's so much we can have on this uh, session of the program. Uh, business Matters continues after this. Demystifying the HR value chain in this new normal is very critical and it's going to be the decider of whether your organization is going to be seen as a success or a failure. People are beginning to embrace new ideas, especially with delivering on their own services. How you are able as an organization to be able to adapt to those changes will help you to be able to certainly thrive in all of your engagement. This is so much we can bring to you on Business Matters on this edition. 
Please follow us on all our different social media handles. I remain Stephen Ipadabal Lawson. Until I come your way again, keep watching Business Matters. <laughs>